Hi, my name is Kat Weiss. I'm a tenure track investigator at the NIDCD Division of Intramural Research. My lab uses primarily patch clamp electrophysiology to investigate the efferent auditory neurons, primarily the medial olive-cochlear neurons that project from the brain stem back to the cochlea. Uh, but today I'm going to be presenting information about the afferent auditory system, specifically the synapse between cochlear and vestibular hair cells onto their primary afferent neurons in the auditory vestibular nerve. So please feel free to email me if you have any questions about this talk. So an outline of what I'll be going over today. First, I will review the basics of cochlear structure and the mechanical properties of the cochlea. I'm going to go through how hair cells are activated by sound and their electrical responses, and then look at some of the afferent auditory nerve responses to sound. Then we're going to really look into the details of how these hair cell responses are translated into auditory nerve activity, specifically looking at some of the specializations at the hair cell and afferent synapses, because to encode the very fast features of sound, you need some very specialized synapses. So uh, there are going to be a few different experimental techniques. It's going to be a focus on patch clamp electrophysiology. So first we're going to look at the cochlear inner hair cell to type 1 afferent spiral ganglion neuron synapse, then the outer hair cell to type 2 afferent synapse, and then finally vestibular hair cell synapses. So here is a review of the activation of the cochlea in a frequency-specific manner, which has been covered in previous lectures, but I'll just go through the basics again here. So here is a cartoon of the cochlear and vestibular system. And if you were to unravel this beautiful cochlear spiral, make it linear, you would see that the low frequency sounds are encoded at the cochlear apex, while the high frequency sounds are encoded at the cochlear base. And this is due to both active and passive mechanical properties of the basilar membrane, kind of roughly shown here in pink, which is the surface on which the hair cells sit. So the properties of the basilar membrane determine what frequencies of sound will really vibrate it. So the traveling wave will have its peak, the peak of its energy for high frequency sounds at the base, and low frequency sounds, the peak of this traveling wave energy will be at the apex of the cochlea. So the location of the basilar membrane that moves determines which hair cells and neurons are activated by that sound. So the hair cells and neurons at the base will be activated by high frequency sounds, while the hair cells and neurons at the apex will be activated by low frequency sounds. So this is what we call the tonotopic organization of the cochlea. Now, if we were to look at the organ of cordy in cross section at any point along the cochlear spiral, we would see that there are the single row of inner hair cells, which are the primary receptors of the auditory system, and then the three rows of outer hair cells, which have an amplification mechanism within the cochlea. So when the traveling wave activates a part of the basilar membrane, it causes the basilar membrane to be pushed up, and the hinge point of the basilar membrane movement is around here. So the basilar membrane moves up in response to sound, which causes pushing up of the hair cells against the tectorial membrane above it, and then it causes shearing open, or it causes shearing of the stereocilia, and this yanks open the tip lengths between the stereocilia and pulls open the mechanotransduction ion channels within the tip lengths. So cations flow into the hair cells, this activates the hair cells, and this is the point where the mechanical nature of sound, or the mechanical information of sound, is translated into an electrical response within the hair cells, and then through their synapses onto auditory neurons, this becomes a neuronal signal that can be encoded by the brain, or interpreted by the brain. So this process is called mechanotransduction. This process whereby the sound opens the mechanotransduction channels and activates the hair cells. So I'll just briefly go through the, uh, the hair cells and neurons within the cochlea. So here are the single row of inner hair cells again, the main receptors of the auditory system. They have their own population of spiral ganglion afferent neurons in blue, which are the type 1 spiral ganglion afferent neurons. 
The outer hair cells have their own population of afferent neurons, which are the type 2 spiral ganglion neurons, and we'll discuss each of these types of neurons separately in a few slides. There are also neurons coming from the brain to innervate the organ of cordy. So the medial olivocochlear efferent neurons, shown in red, form synapses onto outer hair cells, while the lateral olivocochlear efferent synapse not onto the inner hair cells directly, but onto the type 1 spiral ganglion neurons. And Paul Fuchs' lecture will discuss these efferent neurons and their function in greater detail. So today we're going to focus mainly on these efferent neurons and their responses. But first, what is the electrical response of a hair cell to sound? And this depends very much on the frequency of sound. So these are some great classic recordings, sharp electrode recordings from inner hair cells in an animal that is being exposed to sound. So you can put an electrode in the hair cell, play a sound to the animal, and then measure the change in membrane voltage here shown, or measured in millivolts, of the hair cell in response to sound. So sound is a sinusoidal uh, signal. And then the hair cells in response to low frequency sounds like 100 hertz here, will follow this sinusoidal signal with their own sinusoidal voltage responses. And so they can very closely follow the pattern of sound activity or the pattern of sound stimulation. If you increase the frequency of the sound, the, or the, um, the voltage or the potential change of the hair cell also increases increase the sound and the, uh, the frequency response of the hair cell also increases. And so at low frequency sounds, hair cells can follow the sound stimulus with an AC or alternating current depolarization. But if you start to increase the sound frequency even further, and humans can hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, so these are totally typical sound frequencies for our auditory system to encounter, you start to not be able to see, or the, the hair cells can still follow this frequency response, but not quite as well. And you also see that the voltage does not return to baseline. Instead, there is kind of a larger baseline shift, a depolarizing baseline shift. And so above about 650 hertz, hair cells will still have a sinusoidal response, but they will also have a steady DC response, or direct current response, in addition to the AC response. And if you go to even higher frequencies, this AC component becomes a much, um, a much uh, decreased part of the hair cell response to the sound, where the DC component can become more dominant. And so you and then at very high frequencies, you just kind of get this large step depolarization, which then can return to baseline when the sound is over. So the AC response really fails above about 3 kilohertz, but this DC component remains. So this is what we call the receptor potential. So the receptor is the hair cell itself. And then the potential refers to voltage. So this is the voltage change of the hair cells in response to sound. And you can see that there are different, um, different components of this receptor potential change in response to different frequencies and also different intensities of sound. So what is the auditory nerve doing in response to these sounds? Well, this is showing the response of a single auditory nerve axon, so one neuron. And these, uh, these lines here are action potentials in the auditory nerve, so how information is transmitted to the brain electrically. These are very large-scale electrical changes. And you can see these are, um, if they play the same sound over and over to the neuron and record the response many times and then overlay these responses, you tend to see clusters of these action potentials at certain points in their overlaid sound sinusoidal response. And you can see that they tend to occur at the same point in the phase, or the same phase in the sinusoidal response each time. And this is what we refer to as phase locking. And so auditory neurons with low frequency sounds can phase lock to the sound. So they will always respond at about the same point in the sound frequency. But if you then, uh, so efferent neurons can phase lock, but at higher frequency sounds where you no longer have this AC 
response to a sound in the hair cell. Instead, you have this DC step depolarization. Now the timing of spiking or action potentials in the auditory nerve is much more random. So the activity of a single auditory nerve is usually described in terms of its auditory nerve tuning curve, or any neuron in the auditory system can be described by its tuning curve, which roughly describes its responses to different frequencies and different intensities of sound. And so what I'm showing here is how these tuning curves are developed for a single neuron. So in this experiment, the authors record from a single neuron and each of these lines, so this is a voltage trace, and then each of the lines is an action potential in the neuron. So this is different intensities of sound on the y-axis and different frequencies of sound on the x-axis. What the researchers did was to play sound sweeps, so start, starting at a low frequency and then bringing it up to a higher frequency of sound in one sweep, but at the same intensity, and then playing the sweep again to the neuron with increasing intensities. So very, for a very low frequency sweep, you can see that there's a spike here. They play a slightly louder sound frequency sweep. You see a few scattered spikes here and there, played a little bit louder, and now you're starting to see clustering of the spikes around a particular frequency here, 9 to 10 hertz, or kilohertz, I'm sorry. And as you play louder and louder sounds, you see that this neuron is responding to an increased frequency range of sounds with greater intensity. And so when you get up to the loudest, uh, loudest intensity sounds, this neuron is actually responding to quite a range, a large range of frequencies. And so this is fairly typical for a neuron, where for soft sounds, it's going to have a fairly limited range of sounds. And so these are the sound frequencies that it is the most sensitive to, or its characteristic frequency. But as you increase the intensity, it becomes less selective. Now, if you draw kind of a V sort of surrounding this V-shaped set of action potentials, this is what is usually plotted as the auditory nerve tuning curve. And this is a set of tuning curves, all from different neurons with different characteristic frequencies. So the, the trough of the graph here, or of each line, corresponds to the frequency at which the neuron is most, most sensitive, so the best frequency. And each of these neurons has a different best frequency. And this is mostly given by the position of the neurons and their corresponding hair cells along the basal membrane. Okay, so now we're going to focus on how these electrical AC and DC receptor potentials are translated into spikes in the auditory nerve by really focusing on the specialized synapses from hair cells onto spiral ganglion neurons. And we're starting with cochlear responses. And this, this talk really is focused on mammalian hair cells and synapses. And there are both pre- and postsynaptic specializations for very precise but also sustained transmission of sound. This is because sound is a very precise stimulus. It is very fast. It fluctuates quite rapidly. But it also can occur for quite a long time. And so there is sustained transmission. So the neurons and the hair cells in the um, in our auditory systems can be incredibly fast and incredibly powerful, beginning at this first synapse in the cochlea. Okay, so here again is our schematic of the organ of cordy with the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. And we're going to start with the type 1 spiral ganglion afferent neurons. And these neurons receive input from a single inner hair cell. These neurons are shown here in blue. So they get frequency information and intensity information and timing information from one inner hair cell. So the type 1 neurons are about 95% of the spiral ganglion population. They're fast neurons. They are myelinated for fast conduction of their action potentials. And then their axons project to the cochlear nucleus, um, primarily the magnocellular regions of the cochlear nucleus. And they encode the major features of sound. They encode the timing of sound, when it starts, when it ends, how it fluctuates. They encode the intensity of sound. And they also encode the frequency of sound, but this is mostly given by their position along the basilar membrane. Although, as you see before, their frequency responses are also tied into the intensity of sound. 
Okay, so we're going to talk a bit more about synapses here. So first I'm showing a typical neuron, and this is actually from Wikipedia, a typical neuron. So a typical neuron will have a cell body, it will have a lot of dendritic arbors, a lot of branches, and this is where information from other neurons goes into the cell. And then they will transmit this information down their axon, and then this uh, action potentials down the axon will travel into the axon branches. And then these are the presynaptic axon terminals onto the next neuron in the chain. Okay, so here is another typical presynaptic axon terminal synapsing onto a postsynaptic dendrite. So here, neurotransmitters are shown these little red blobs, and they are stored in uh, bilipid membranes within the axon terminal. So what happens when a single neuron is stimulated to a high enough degree and causes an action potential? That action potential propagates down the axon and then into the axon terminal. It strongly activates and depolarizes the nerve terminal, which causes um, voltage-gated calcium channels within the axon terminal to open. There is calcium influx into the cell, and then these vesicles contain calcium-sensitive proteins, which will cause fusion of the vesicle with the presynaptic axon terminal, and this fusion will cause release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter then diffuses across the cleft, binds to postsynaptic receptors in the dendrite, and then there is a postsynaptic response in this postsynaptic cell. And so this is the electrochemical synapse, where the electrical activity in the axon is converted into a chemical signal in the synapse, which is then usually converted back into an electrical signal in the dendrite. And this propagates through the system, carrying information. Okay, so I already went through this. Neurotransmitter released into the synapse, um, attaches to vesicles. Oh, and here are some examples of electrical postsynaptic responses, and these are shown in voltage clamp. So you can have kind of a fast inward response here. And this, in this case, these are excitatory cationic synaptic responses. Now, hair cells have very specialized synapses. And I want to start off by pointing out that hair cells are not neurons. They are epithelial cells. They do not have axons, but they do form synapses. They do depolarize, even though hair cells do not have action potentials, they do have this graded receptor potential. So this depolarization in response to activation by sound. And they do release neurotransmitter from vesicles. So here is a cartoon again of a hair cell showing sound deflecting the stereocilia. We know that cations will enter the cell, depolarize it. And then here what it's showing are the presynaptic synaptic are the presynaptic active zones and some of the specializations here, which I'll go into, synapsing onto a postsynaptic spiral ganglion neuron. So one interesting thing about hair cells is that the immature hair cells do spike or have action potentials. This is a developmental stage, but the mature hair cells do not. So as I said, they have this, what we call a graded receptor potential. So an action potential is all or, not, all, all or none, a binary kind of signal, but the hair cells have a much more analog kind of graded signal. And this affects how much neurotransmitter re is released onto the postsynaptic neuron. And I just said this, mature hair cells respond to sound with a graded receptor potential that evokes varying degrees of neurotransmitter release. Okay, so what are some of the specializations at hair cell synapses? This cartoon from the Moser lab shows one of the very special um, so, uh, structures within hair cells, which are called presynaptic ribbons. But first, why do hair cell synapses need to be specialized? That's because sound is fast. It's very fast, from 20 to 20 kilohertz for humans and much faster for other species that can be encoded or um, received by our systems and perceived by our auditory systems. So this requires very high fidelity responses to the sound in order to encode it very accurately, very faithfully. It requires powerful synapses 
and it requires fast neurons. And so the auditory system is extremely specialized for speed and for power. So one of the presynaptic specializations in the hair cells are shown in this box here. These are presynaptic ribbons, which were first seen in retinal, um, I believe bipolar cells, or perhaps retinal ganglion cells, where there is a structure that is electron dense and seen in, um, in transmission electron micrographs, which is very dark and looks like a ribbon in retinal cells. And they're surrounded by vesicles. And so these ribbons can have some special presynaptic proteins. Um, CTBP2 is a, or ribeye, is one of the proteins within the ribbons. There are also other specialized proteins at the presynaptic active zone, such as otoferlin, which is unique to cochlear hair cells and a few other cells in the brain or in the, uh, in the body. And this is thought to be one of the calcium sensors that is very specialized in the auditory system. Hair cells have an unusual vesicular glutamate transporter, which is VGLUT3, which loads glutamate, which is the neurotransmitter used by hair cells, into the vesicles for release onto the postsynaptic neurons. There is also very specialized clustering of the presynaptic calcium channels, the voltage-gated calcium channels that enable neurotransmitter release from vesicles at the active zones. And there's been quite a lot of work looking at the special clustering of calcium channels. And these are just a few examples. There are many other specializations at the presynaptic active zones of hair cells. On the postsynaptic neuron side, there are fast postsynaptic neurotransmitter receptors to help encode this very fast signal and sound. And the action potential initiation site is very close to the synapses in the type 1 spiral ganglion neurons, which I'll describe in a few slides. And also these type 1 neurons are interesting in that they are myelinated not just in their axons, but also in what can be considered their dendrites that project to the inner hair cells. And so they are myelinated all the way, almost all the way, up to their synapses with the hair cells. So they're myelinated along the peripheral fiber, myelinated around the soma, myelinated at the axons. So some of the techniques that are used to measure activity at these synapses involve single cell patch clamp recordings. And some of the details of this are gone through in Paul's recording about patch clamp techniques. So one of the techniques that I'll go through here is a method for examining the release of neurotransmitter from bilipid vesicles. So this is a measurement called capacitance, and this is an electrical property of uh, many systems, but including biological electrical systems. So capacitance measures the buildup of charge across two plates. So you can have positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other, and if there is something separating these different plates and preventing the movement, of charges across the capacitor, you can build up these charges and it kind of stores charge a little bit like a battery. Now you can measure the capacitance and this will do to the amount of charge stored, but it can also be changed by properties of the capacitor itself. If you increase the surface of the capacitor, if you make it bigger, you can increase the measured capacitance. And also, if you bring those plates a little bit closer together, which can increase the attraction of those opposite charges to each other, you can also increase the capacitance. But what we use this for in biological systems is to approximately measure um, the, the changes in size of a neuron. So this is a cartoon showing kind of a typical axon terminal and a, a neuron is, uh, has a bilipid membrane. So charges will not go through electrical charges. Ions will not just pass through this bilipid membrane unless there is a specific channel that allows them to flow. But there are ion pumps which will build up charges across the, the membrane and neurons tend to be negative on the inside and positive on the outside. So you have a buildup of charges across the bilipid membrane, which you can measure. And then what happens is that when an axon is activated by an action potential and these vesicles containing neurotransmitter fuse with the presynaptic membrane to release neurotransmitter into the cleft,
this little bit of bilipid membrane in the vesicle becomes part of the, the membrane of the cell. And so the membrane of the cell gets just a tiny bit bigger. And so if you are measuring the capacitance of a cell and evoke neurotransmitter release and this fusion of the vesicle with the presynaptic active zone, you can measure an increase in capacitance. So the cell getting just a little bit bigger because you're adding this membrane to the cell. And so you can measure changes in capacitance to get an idea of whether or not a cell is releasing neurotransmitter. And you can also de or measure decreases in capacitance, which could be due to endocytosis of the, these vesicles back into the cell. So capacitance can increase as a cell gets larger because this vesicle, when it fuses, will add a tiny bit of membrane to the cell. And this increased capacitance indicates vesicle fusion. So if you record from an inner hair cell, and you can strongly depolarize the cell through the patch pipette, this is measuring the calcium current, so it triggers voltage-gated calcium channels, which will enter, uh, which will cause calcium influx into the cell, so you can measure the corresponding calcium current, which causes vesicle fusion. If you are simultaneously measuring the capacitance of the cell, and then evoke calcium influx and presumably neurotransmitter release, you can see that there is a slight increase measured in femtofarads here in the capacitance of the cell. So um, here what they're using is a very strong depolarization step, a voltage step from about minus 80 millivolts to minus 10 millivolts. So this is strongly activating the inner hair cell. And then the stimulation causes this increase in capacitance, which indicates neurotransmitter release via vesicle fusion. Okay, so that is how some of the very um, large amounts of release of neurotransmitter from the presynaptic inner hair cell can be measured. You can also use the capacitance technique to measure um, certain mutations that might cause defects in neurotransmitter release. Okay, so one of the other um, major presynaptic spe uh, specializations that I mentioned earlier is this ribbon. And these are called ribbon synapses in the inner hair cell. So it's the presynaptic electron dense body. It can be stained for an antibody against ribeye or CTBP2. It's found in retinal rods and bipolar cells, cochlear inner and outer hair cells, vestibular hair cells, zebrafish, lateral line hair cells, and other types of cells. So the ribbon is surrounded by vesicles. And these ribbons in these systems are associated with something called multivesicular release. So at many traditional brain synapses, a presynaptic terminal, even when activated by an action potential, will release you know, sometimes a vesicle or two. But at the inner hair cell, it will release multiple vesicles when stimulated. So here are some images, some TEM images of a ret or of a I'm sorry, a inner hair cell ribbon, and they're pointing out a few of the other structural um, specialties. So bassoon is another protein associated with ribbons. There are voltage-gated channels presynaptically, glutamate receptors in the postsynaptic side, and then here are the synaptic vesicles, and these are all colored here for better visualization. And then this is a um, this is a 3D view of a ribbon in red surrounded by vesicles. So um, the vesicles that are in red are very close to the membrane, so they're considered docked and primed and ready for release. Okay, so no one is really sure why ribbons are involved in multivesicular release. How do they how do they allow what we call this indefatigable release of neurotransmitter from the hair cells or from the retinal um, rod and bipolar cells? Now, there are a few hypotheses. Um, one is that somehow these ribbons allow the synchronized fusion of multiple vesicles at the same time. Or maybe somehow they allow many of the vesicles to fuse with each other prior to release. So kind of the sausage hypothesis. You get a lot of vesicles fusing together. All of the neurotransmitter will really build up and then it will all get released at the same time. Or maybe presynaptically you get a number of the vesicles fusing and then they all in kind of a big blob dump their neurotransmitters synchronously. Um, 
It could be some sort of conveyor belt hypothesis where all of these um, vesicles are really pushed towards the presynaptic membrane very fast. It could be maintaining the vesicle population at the synapses. These, uh, these ribbons could be involved in filling up space to control calcium increases around the ribbon. And uh, this, this um, I, I'm just showing some of the data for the space filling model. This is a model by Cole Graydon when he was a postdoc with, I'm sorry, a grad student with Bashara Kashar, showing here a model of the ribbon itself with some of the presynaptic vesicles modeled. And then this is a two-dimensional view of the synapse itself, showing that with a ribbon, when there is a voltage-gated calcium channel open, you get a very restricted amount of calcium influx, but a very high amount. And then um, without the ribbon, you have more diffusion of the calcium, but not as high of a response. But then showing that you might get much more calcium influx close to all of the ribbons if you have the vesicle present. So this space filling model. But really at this point, we still don't know exactly how the ribbon supports multivesicular release. So I want to show what some of the postsynaptic responses are to neurotransmitter release in the type 1 spiral ganglion neuron. So the technique that is employed here is patch clamp recordings from the afferent bouton. And this is a technique developed by Elizabeth Glowatsky when she was a postdoc with Paul Fuchs. What Elizabeth did is to use her patch pipette to perform whole cell recordings from the postsynaptic bouton of the type 1 afferent neuron. So very high spatial resolution and high electrical resolu resolution recordings of the activity in the postsynaptic neuron in response to neurotransmitter release from the inner hair cell. So here is an image through her recording microscope with DIC optics. And so here are the inner hair cells and she's drawn, drawn dotted lines around them and the stereocilia. This is her patch electrode and it is patched onto this tiny little dot right there, little dot, which is the postsynaptic bouton of the type one neuron. And that's about a micron in diameter. So it's about the same size as Elizabeth's patch pipette. So she can suction onto one of those, suction a little bit more to form a whole cell axis, uh, uh, make a little hole between the recording electrode and the type one bouton. And then she has con continuity, electrical and, um, and fluid continuity between the bouton, the bouton and her patch pipette. And so she can record what is happening inside that neuron in response to activity in this hair cell. So here are what some of these responses look like. Some of these are very fast synchronous responses of a fairly smooth increase, a fairly smooth rise and an exponential decay. But note the axis here or the scale bars. This is 200 and picoamps. So these can be single postsynaptic responses up to 800 picoamps, which is gigantic for a postsynaptic response especially considering that this single neuron is receiving input from a single active zone in a single inner hair cell, which is very different from a neuron in the brain, which will be receiving synaptic inputs from many other neurons at the same time. This is a huge, fast response to just one synaptic input, and it is very smooth. So this is suggesting that this multivesicular release not only releases many vesicles at the same time, but also synchronously. So all of these vesicles and all of the neurotransmitters just being dumped all at the same time to get these very fast responses. And so these large and fast postsynaptic responses are characteristic of the multivesicular release in the hair cells. And also sound can go on for a very long time. And so it's also known that these hair cells can just keep on releasing neurotransmitter and you can keep having these large postsynaptic responses for a very long time. So it is the indefatigable release from the hair cells onto the afferent neurons. And so here is some of the evidence that the neurotransmitter released by the hair cells is glutamate because now if you record instead of in voltage clamp in an in current clamp, and now I'm sorry, this is still voltage clamp. These are current responses, but they've changed the membrane voltage. You can see that these are now upward 
uh, deflections, and so each of these lines is, it's just kind of a zoomed out view, each of these lines is a postsynaptic response, and you can block these responses with CNQX, which is an antagonist of amphotype glutamate receptor. So this eliminates the postsynaptic responses, which then return upon launch. So if you can block the responses with an AMPA receptor blocker, it indicates that these hair cells are releasing glutamate, which activates postsynaptic AMPA receptors during sound. So these, um, the, the type 1 neuron, it has these very large and fast responses to neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic inner hair cell, but they also have very reliable timing. And this is work done by Anya Yi when she was a postdoc with Elizabeth Kowalski. This is showing a voltage response now while patching onto one of the type 1 spiral ganglion boutons. Again, a figure from Elizabeth's paper shown here. And now it's showing the voltage response to neurotransmitter release from a presynaptic cell. So these smaller responses here are postsynaptic potentials. The potential now indicates a voltage change. Well, these larger responses are spikes or action potentials. And here is a zoom of some of them. And what the arrow is indicating is the threshold of the action potential and also the timing of the responses. And so first, we know that a very large percentage of these excitatory postsynaptic potentials will be super threshold. So large enough to evoke a spike in the auditory neuron. And these are, so it's about 25%. And these are recordings that are done in fairly young rats prior to hearing onset. And so we know that the, um, or it's possible that the reliability of translation from postsynaptic potential to spike could increase and become more reliable after hearing onset. And we also know that there is very little jitter in the timing of the action potentials from onset of a stimulus to the timing of the spike. And so this is shown in the timing of the elbow here, and this is in milliseconds, and this looks like a lot of jitter, but it's actually a very precise action potential timing relative to a lot of brain neurons. And this has also been investigated through the work of Juan Gutman and Mark Rutherford. And so the timing from synaptic response to spike in the auditory nerve is very precise. And I'm going to go into a bit about why it is so precise. Um, first, by contrasting it to a typical neuron, again, the Wikipedia neuron, where what happens is you get the synaptic inputs into the dendrites and postsynaptic responses, which themselves can be of varying amplitude and kinetics. These responses, the postsynaptic potentials, need to propagate through the branches of the dendrites there is going to be electrical filtering of those signals. They're going to be a little bit smeared out in timing. They're going to be a little bit smaller in amplitude by the time they collect at the cell body. And when you get enough of these inputs summing at the cell body, so integrating, you can cross spike threshold at the axon initi initi initiation site, excuse me, which is the, um, or the, I'm sorry, the axon initial segment which is the spike initiation zone, a place where there are many voltage-gated sodium channels which are involved in initiating the action potential. This all are one very large response in the neuron. So all of these small signals need to add up and propagate through the neuron to get to this spike initiation zone. So you can imagine that the timing from the synaptic input to the spike can be highly variable. Now contrast this to the inner hair cell to type 1 spiral ganglion neuron, where the neuron is only getting input from a single inner hair cell, so it is not summing input from multiple in, uh, not summing uh, signals from multiple synaptic inputs, so it's just one response. And as we saw before, it is a very large and fast response due to multivesicular release from the inner hair cell, and then this cartoon indicates that very close to the synapse, there is myelin in the type 1 neuron axon. So the axon initiation zone, or the axon initial segment, this is, well, it's a dendrite, but it's actually structured much more like an axon. The spike initiation zone is right here. There are a lot of sodium channels right here. So the distance traveled from synaptic input to spike is very small. 
And so this can quite improve the timing and the precision of synaptic input to spike. And so some of these specializations that give rise to this are shown here in work from Mark Rutherford's lab, where they have done immunolabeling of some of the, um, the proteins involved in the spike initiation zone. And in this work, they are showing the developmental patterning and the developmental precision and refinement of the location of these proteins. But here they are showing an eventual localization of these proteins at postnatal day 30. So here, if you were to take this inner hair cell and tilt it onto its side, the hair cell would be here, and then each of these lines is a type 1 spiral ganglion neuron. And so in green, these are voltage-gated sodium channels right here at the axon initial segment, or I'm sorry, the spike initiation zone, which is at the habenula perforata, HP, in the type 1 neuron. There are also voltage-gated um, potassium channels here, and they're also standing for Casper, which is a membrane protein involved in anchoring these voltage-gated channels. So you can see that there is quite a density of these very important channels for action potentials very close to the type 1 synapse from the hair cell. So the type 1 neuron myelination begins close to the habenula perforata, and the action potentials are initiated here, very close to the synapse. And so this gives very reliable action potential timing right at the first synapse and the first neuron of the auditory system. Okay, so summary of the type 1 afferent neurons. There is a graded receptor potential in the inner hair cell, generates neurotransmitter release at ribbon synapses, and this encodes the major features of sound in the type 1 neurons, which is the timing of sound, the intensity of sound, as well as the frequency of sound, which is given by position along the basilar membrane. And so the synaptic responses are um, characterized by multivesicular release from the inner hair cell. And then the neuron itself is specialized for fast, high fidelity responses. Now there is some heterogeneity of type 1 afferent neurons, which involve so there is also some considerable heterogeneity of the type 1 afferent neurons themselves, which can contribute to, to encoding some of the different um, aspects of sound. So some of the neurons have different synaptic and electrical properties, which can increase the dynamic range of cochlear signaling. So neurons that can uh, encode softer or louder sounds, both presynaptic to the same inner hair cell. And this was discussed somewhat in um, Tom Coates' lecture. And also some neurons are more susceptible to damage. So in the damaged and aging ear, there will be a different complement of neurons that are encoding sound, or not the full complement. So the type 2 spiral ganglion neurons are the other type of afferent auditory neuron. And this is a um, this is an image showing the relative morphology of the two types of neurons, where the type 1 spiral ganglion neurons will project to contact a single inner hair cell, while the type 2 neurons will project to contact multiple outer hair cells, and they have this characteristic turn towards the cochlear base. So the type 2 neurons, so they have inputs from multiple outer hair cells here, they are about 5% of the spiral ganglion afferent population, while the type 1 neurons are 95% of the population. They are unmyelinated, while the type 1, these type 2 neurons are unmyelinated, while the type 1 neurons are myelinated. And their function is unknown. They've actually been referred to as silent neurons because they have not yet been shown to respond to sound. So here again is our um, very typical axon terminal onto a postsynaptic neuronal dendrite. And I use this again to illustrate the idea of capacitance, the electrical measurement from single cells, where when you increase the measure of capacitance, it indicates neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic cell due to the uh, bilipid vesicle membrane fusing with the axon terminal and making the axon terminal and the whole cell just a little bit bigger. For quite a long time, there was morphological evidence, mostly from EM, of vesicles in the outer hair cells, but it had not been shown that the outer hair cells release neurotransmitter onto their afferent type 2 neurons. 
and so it wasn't really known if the outer hair cells signal anything to the brain. Uh, this recording from Marlene Bjord shows was a, one of the first studies to show that the outer hair cells do, in fact, release neurotransmitter. So here she's recording the capacitance in the outer hair cells. And then this is a voltage measurement from the hair cell while she stimulates it very strongly to zero millivolts. And this is the calcium influx into the cell. And you do see an increase in the capacitance in response to this depolarization. So this indicates that outer hair cells do indeed release vesicles because there is an increase in capacitance due to fusion of vesicles with the presynaptic membrane. But it was not known what neurotransmitters the outer hair cells would release. So as I mentioned, to review, the stimulation can induce a capacitance change in the cochlear outer hair cells. And it's evidence that the outer hair cells are capable of releasing neurotransmitter but this neurotransmitter is unknown, and actually the role of outer hair cell afferent signaling is still mostly unknown. So in order to find out what the neurotransmitter was released from the outer hair cell onto the type 2 afferent neuron and to really characterize the synapse, you need to be able to do postsynaptic recordings. So when I joined Paul Fuchs and Elizabeth Glowatsky's lab as a graduate student, we developed a, together a technique to perform patch clamp recordings in the whole cell configuration now from the type 2 afferent dendrites. And here is a schematic of the recording with the synapse from outer hair cells and then the recording along the dendritic fiber. So here is a view from the first presentation of this technique showing the view through the recording scope. And here are the three rows of outer hair cells, the stereocilia. This is my patch pipette, and it's patched onto the dendrite of one of the type 2 neurons, which you can see there, and it's shown in purple here for better visibility. So these are typical patch clamp recordings now from the type 2 dendrite. And so you can fill your recording electrode with a dye to diffuse into the cell. So this is a two-photon image of a, of a type 2 neuron from which a recording is performed. Here is the electrode filled with dye, and here is the morphology of this neuron under the outer hair cells, and this is where it turns towards the base, or I'm sorry, it turns, uh, this is the turn towards the base, and the cell body would be about here. Okay, so first what I did was record in voltage clamp. And this is the current response. And so you can see occasionally these downward lines in voltage clamp. And if you do a zoom of one of those lines, they have a stereotypical postsynaptic response with a fast rise and a slower exponential decay. If you apply high potassium solution of 15 or 40 millimolar potassium, it does cause an inward current directly in the fiber itself. But this also stimulates all presynaptic cells or all cells in the tissue but it stimulates presynaptic cells to release neurotransmitter. And then you record more of these downward deflections, more of these synaptic inputs. And so you can record these synaptic responses of the type 2 neurons to release from the presynaptic outer hair cells. Now in this plot, each dot is one of these postsynaptic currents, or PSCs. And then there are varying amplitudes. And this is showing how, or the amplitude of them as they occur over time. And so if you apply a, an amper receptor blocker here, NBQX, you can eliminate these postsynaptic responses. And then as, after you wash out the NBQX, they do return. So this indicates because you can block the synaptic responses with an amper receptor blocker, and amper receptors respond to glutamate, this indicates that outer hair cells release glutamate. Now, what's interesting is that outer hair cells also have ribbons presynaptically, but with other work that I'm not showing here, we showed that there is fairly sparse and weak glutamatergic release from the outer hair cells. Um, however, the type 2 neurons can have up to 30 presynaptic inner hair cells, so this indicates that perhaps they are integrating inputs from multiple outer hair cells, and many of these inputs need to sum to evoke a spike in the type 2 neuron. So here is some computational modeling. Here is one of these type 2 neurons and showing axon branches and I've placed um, different synaptic inputs computationally on this dendrite. And here is the voltage response of a single synaptic input in the model. And it takes summation of six 
of these responses in order to cross spike threshold and evoke an action potential in the type 2 neurons. So this suggests that you need multiple synapses from outer hair cells to all be occurring synchronously in order to evoke the kind of stimulation in a type 2 neuron that would be actually transmitted to the brain via an action potential. And it suggests that either the type 2 neurons are integrating, so or integrators integrating many small responses, perhaps over the distance along the cochlear spiral or over time, if these are slow enough responses. It also suggests that perhaps the type 2 neurons require uh, stimulation of all of the presynaptic outer hair cells simultaneously, perhaps due to a strong stimulation like a loud sound. And this gives the idea that perhaps the type 2 neurons respond specifically to loud sounds or to painful, damaging stimulation. So some very interesting work to look into this idea it comes again from Paul Fuchs's lab, work done by Chong Lu when she was a graduate student. Here she's recording from a single type 2 neuron and she's filled it here with biocytin. So you can see the morphology of the type 2 neuron. And here is the cell body. And here in DIC is her recording pipette patched onto a type 2 dendrite. She's using another pipette to, to, um, to poke an outer hair cell, to poke it and rupture it, to cause it to release its contents, which includes purines, ATP and UTP, and all sorts of other molecules that might spill out of a cell when it is damaged. And so this is to kind of uh, mimic sort of damage that would be caused by really loud sound that could even um, kill hair cells and cause them to rupture. And so what she showed, so this is um, filling all of the cells with FM143 to um, fluorescently label them. And you can see that one of the hair cells, she pokes it and then it dies because it's kind of losing its membrane integrity there. Here is a voltage response of the type 2 neuron when she pokes one of the neighboring outer hair cells. And it strongly depolarizes the type 2 neuron to the point where it has an action potential. So damaging a nearby outer hair cell can cause a spike in the type 2 neuron. And these spikes are the things that are transmitted to the brain. And here is now a current response showing the, um, the response of the type 2 neuron, the, the very large inward current in response to poking a neighboring outer hair cell. And when she puts purine ATP receptor blockers um, or purine receptor blockers onto the bath, it prevents this response. And so we know that this, these very strong activating responses are due to release of purines from the damaged cells, both ATP and UTP. So in summary of the outer hair cells to the type 2 neurons, we know that these type 2 neurons receive glutamatergic synaptic inputs from outer hair cells. And the type 2 neurons, they can generate action potentials, which was also not known until recently. They respond to ATP and they can be stimulated by outer hair cell rupture. But the role of the type 2 neurons is in hearing is still unknown. They could respond to pain or to damage. They could integrate sound over time. But they still are somewhat mysterious and there's still plenty of work to be done to find out their role in hearing both in a normal cochlea as well as in a damaged or aging cochlea. Okay, so finally, I would like to look at some of the specializations of the vestibular synapses in the mammalian, in the mammalian uh, vestibular system. So here is a schematic from um, work from Ruth Ann Etuck, and it is showing the two types of vestibular hair cells. So in the striola, which is the sensitive center of otolith organs, there are these type 1 vestibular hair cells, which are kind of flask shaped. And then in the extrastriolar regions, there are more of these type 2 neurons, which are more column shaped. But what also distinguishes the type of neurons is, or the type of hair cells, is the type of postsynaptic neuron that contacts them. So you can see that these, uh, these neurons in gray form what is a postsynaptic calyx, this kind of cup surrounding the type 1 hair cell. And so it is the only known postsynaptic calyx in the nervous system. There are other presynaptic calyxes. And so a single neuron will form a calyx um, receiving inputs from a single inner or a single type 1 neuron. But each of these neurons can innervate and form calyxes on multiple hair cells. 
So a hair cell will signal to one neuron, but multiple hair cells can signal to the same neuron. There are also these Bhutan-only afferent neurons, which look a little bit more like the uh, the cochlear neurons, where they will have these long dendrites out and form a postsynaptic Bhutan, postsynaptic to the synapse in the type 2 hair cells. But there are also, interestingly, some neurons that can form both a calyx around a type 1 hair cell or a Bhutan at a type 2 hair cell. And there is great work being done to look at the different roles of these different types of neurons and what their responses are like um, due to activation of the presynaptic hair cells. Uh, we do know that the vestibular hair cells are activated by vestibular sensations, so rotation or gravity or motion, uh, very similar to the way that cochlear hair cells are activated by uh, shearing of the stereocilia, although they do have a very long kinocilium, but shearing of the stereocilia and opening of mechanical transduction channels. So vestibular hair cells also have a graded receptor potential that can change in response to the strength of the stimulation. And opening of the mechanical transduction channel also allows influx of cations, mostly potassium and calcium. But so the vestibular neuron responses are very interesting. So in this work from uh, Ruth Ann Etock's lab uh, from Jocelyn Songer, it's showing here a view of the sacculus and the striola is indicated here in red, mainly comprised of type one hair cells, which will have postsynaptic calyces from calyces, calyx only neurons. And here they are doing recordings from both the presynaptic hair cell and the postsynaptic neuron. This is a DIC image showing uh, both a probe to activate stereocilia and also showing that they can record from the soma and the postsynaptic calyx. And you can see here that they have filled both with dye. And this calyx neuron is surrounding three adjacent hair cells. And so it's receiving inputs from three different hair cells all of which are releasing glutamate. Now, some of these neurons might also be forming Bhutan endings onto type two neurons, and they might be uh, they might be receiving input from a type one neuron at more of a distance than these three adjacent hair cells. I'm sorry, hair cell at more of a distance. And so you tend to see more heterogeneous responses in the vestibular neurons. And so here are examples from recordings from the neuron. This is by Suresh Sadegi in, when he was a postdoc with Elizabeth Kowatsky. And showing that you do have some very fast postsynaptic responses. The uh, time scale here is three milliseconds. But an, an, in the same neuron, you can also have a much slower response. And here, look at the time scale. This is a 27 millisecond time scale. And so this is much faster than this. They are just plotted on different time scales. And they can also have different patterns given by these uh, different exponential decays within the same response. And so this indicates that you can have calyx and Bhutan inputs. They can occur at different, um, from different distances, can affect the amplitudes and the kinetics. And you can also have these very fast responses, which can be due to synaptic release at the active zone and immediate uptake or immediate response by the postsynaptic neuron. But you can also have glutamate accumulation in the synaptic cleft because this is a very enclosed space between the hair cell and the neuron. And that is what is thought to give rise to these very slow responses. So low concentrations of glutamate that is stuck in the cleft. But these different modes of operation are thought to contribute to the very wide range of frequencies that the vestibular system can respond to. So the slow responses of gravity or moving your head slowly, and also things like the amount of, um, of movement that your head experiences when you're doing something like riding on a horse. So very, very different time scales can be encoded by the vestibular system, perhaps by mechanisms such as this. And one that I'm not describing in detail is that potassium itself is also thought to be a neurotransmitter at these vestibular hair cell to neuron synapses and can also contribute to the heterogeneity of postsynaptic responses. And so a summary of vestibular hair cell signaling is shown here. You have the type one hair cells, which have postsynaptic calyx endings. They also have ribbons 
and they synapse um, through glutamate release onto postsynaptic amber receptors. Potassium flow through the cell and extrusion out the base of the hair cell can also contribute to signaling, as well as glutamate buildup within the cleft. The type 2 hair cells will receive bouton endings from either bouton only or um, bouton calyx neurons. And there are also efferents to the hair cells, which I will not go into today. Um, but these other, these morphological specializations, these structural specializations within the vestibular system are thought to contribute to the heterogene heterogeneous responses. So in conclusion for the lecture, sound information is converted from an analog signal, so the sinusoidal wave, to digital action potentials in the auditory neurons that can be interpreted by the brain. And this happens from the hair cell synapse onto the afferent neurons. These hair cell synapses are very specialized with both pre and postsynaptic specializations, and they are um, able to encode the very fast, powerful, high fidelity signals required for encoding these properties of sound. Sound is fast. Sound also fluctuates quickly, and we can hear many orders of magnitude of sound intensity. And so starting at the first synapse in the auditory system, these are very specialized uh, neurons and hair cells to encode these properties. So inner hair cells and outer hair cells in the cochlea do have very different synaptic functions, with the inner hair cells being the primary receptors. And I didn't go into it much today, but the outer hair cells have an amplification role in the cochlea but they have different synaptic functions and different release properties onto their afferent neurons and different specializations. And the, the postsynaptic neurons have their own different specializations for either fast, precise timing and very powerful, um, precise responses to sound, or in the case of the type one neurons, or in the case of the type two neurons, possibly responses to pain or other molecules or integration of sound over time. And vestibular systems also, the vestibular synapses also have spe specializations that allow them to act on a very wide range of time scales. Okay, so please feel free to contact me with any questions, and I will also be available um, for um, questions during the one hour on July 23rd. So uh, thank you very much.